Thank you for tuning in to the World Builder's Anvil, episode 204. I love that we're saying 200 mm. now. 200 and whatever. That's a big number. Uh, I hope you guys love explosions. I know I do, and it's totally appropriate because today we're talking about holidays. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place where we will prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builder's Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Let's sup from the muck of Java and build. Welcome back. As always, my name is Jeffrey And explodingly w. yours, I am Michael Miller. That could be taken a number of different ways. That's right. It is all over the screen right now. But we'd like to welcome you to our little show here. We like to talk about world building and, and the things that surround world building, the world building supreme type of stuff. And uh, because we're, we're vastly approaching, uh, I think we just passed a Thanksgiving uh, in the world of mm, people. Here all that us, turkey. But, um, happy Thanksgiving to all of those who just had it. And to those of you who did not. Uh, have it uh, well. I hope yeah, you if you're not familiar in the United States, we have this holiday that, for modern Americans, is a gluttonous day of eating, where we eat dinner at like for some reason between noon and three p.m. I don't know why. Everyone like in my family always is like, oh, dinner's at two p.m. I don't usually eat dinner till like mm-hmm. between five and nine p.m. Sometimes ten p.m. So two p.m. is ridiculous. Like I, that's lunch for me. Um. Mm. And it's actually a holiday that is kind of ridiculous because, you know, what we eat for the holiday is not what they ate. And it's celebrating something that wasn't really all that good. So I don't know. Yeah. So holidays. We're talking about holidays. We're talking about how they come to be and some of the weird holidays that do exist. And I think, uh, Jeffrey, you're going to share some of uh, your holidays with us. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about sort of how I came up with the sequence of the overall holidays for Bedrakum. Obviously, I'm a believer in building out frames. I don't have all of my not every one, uh, but I no not, not every one. But I do have a, a, a structure of how I got to them, and one of them is sort of looking at just basically really what is a holiday, and uh, a holiday uh, was sort of there. There were two major types of days, especially if you go to like feudal Europe. Uh, which is kind of where the holiday comes to us from. Can I guess? The Can idea I guess? Was, uh, go uh, I'm going to guess. I mean, obviously, there's got to be some sort of religious component for one, and I'm thinking something either celebrating a war or celebrating the end of a war. Uh, yes, uh, that, that that's pretty good. And, and that's kind of where they, they, they derive from the term holy day. Shocking if you look <laughs> at the word holiday. Um and the idea was they were holy days. In the Middle Ages, they turned into what was called feast days. So you'd have uh, the Feast of St. Michael, uh, the Feast of St. Jeffrey, the the Bold. <laughs> the Bold? Uh, I'm surprised you, you went have, with that. <laughs> I was I was uh, expecting yeah, St. Jeffrey the Wise or maybe uh, St. Jeffrey the Handsome. <laughs> but, you know, if you can't self-deprecate yourself once in a while, who can, you know, I wouldn't feel right making fun of anyone else. So, um, But the idea was... Uh, that is typically the foundation culturally for holidays. So it's really important to know what is holy to a culture to build holidays for them. And that is the foundational thing. There's the opposite of them, uh, especially in like medieval uh, England, definitely. But I think in most feudal areas, there was something like it. called. I think they were called Lord's Days. And they were the days that you had to work in the fields for As the As opposed Lord. to the Lord our God, we're to, we're talking the about Lord, your 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 commander. local Lord. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is kind of ironic if it was actually called Lord's Day. Which I remember that, but I I don't have a reference for that one, so I could be wrong. But it was the idea of the number of days you worked a year uh, that essentially uh, would equate to the amount of food you were handing over to the Lord. So like they'd break up fields by parcels. And so you would have to work some in your parcels and some in the Lord's parcels because you had to feed him. And guess who got his food first? Uh, uh, the Lord. That was, was my Lord. guess, yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and that could actually very much change in different um, ca- county to county. Like if you were in a place like England, it, it, could, it, it could vary county to county how many 
feast days you had and how many days that you had to work for your Lord. And it wasn't a lot. You actually worked a lot less of your life towards the Lord, towards your taxes back then than you do today. However, the difference was that you needed to spend so much time struggling to just live that if they took much more, people would just die off and it really wouldn't work out overall. So that probably helped control the amount of time that you worked towards paying your taxes back in the old days, which was by supplying food. Typically. And just to point out what you have written here, it says the Lord's Day or Tax Day. Mm-hmm. So that's yes, uh, or tax that's day. a holiday. <laughs> no, those really weren't holidays. Those were anti holidays. <laughs> anti, these are the uh, anti holidays. Well, like a recognized special annual. These day. are the anti holidays. One well, thing about it, it's kind of like April fifteenth is in the United States, um, except uh, it would happen like. You know, I like say like 13 or 17 times mm-hmm. a year, um, you know, which is, you know, equivalent to how much you were supposedly paying in taxes. Uh, but that's a different episode, taxes. So, uh, but uh, the big thing to keep in mind is there are two big instances where across pretty much every culture, uh, one or both of these things are exceptionally important. It is the equinoxes and solstices. Uh, most holy days. Uh, are considered holy days in most cultures, and um, most are, uh, uh, and some might be more important than other ones, but typically most cultures have some kind of holiday, some kind of important occasion uh, paired to uh, your solstices and your equinoxes. And the solstice is where you have the longest and shortest day of the year. That's uh, essentially when you're, uh, the sun's passing the Tropic of Capricorn or Cancer on Earth. So if it's you're passing the, the, the Tropic of Capricorn in the Northern Hemisphere, we're having winter because the sun is the furthest away from us. And it's summer when it's over top of the Tropic of Capricorn. If I got I, those names. I am not a hundred percent certain of my science, but I seem to remember that that's not true. That what you're saying is only not accurate. And I and I could be wrong here, so so if any of this mm. sounds you are, but go ahead. <laughs> because I seem to remember reading that it's not the distance the Earth is from the sun, but the angle at which the sunlight hits. Uh, it's the angle. It's the angle okay. you're pointed. That is correct. So because but, when it's over, when it's over, my, my, my point, my but the distance matters. But my too. point for mentioning this is, I seem to remember reading that we are actually closer to the sun during our winter than we are during our summer. Which is actually why our summers aren't as extreme as they are in the southern hemisphere. So the distance matters for temperature. But it's the angle. So, like when it's over the the, uh, the tropic, uh, the tropic of Cancer in the southern hemisphere, you're angled away from the sun in the northern hemisphere. So you get the, uh, and we happen to be closer at that time. So we get a little bit more mild winters. <clears throat> However, that's kind of made up for with the amount of land mass. The uh, one, and then we get uh, mild. One summers. of the funniest things I ever heard in my life, uh, in regards to uh, the Earth's distance to the sun, was. <laughs> if I can get it out, I was working in a. Um, uh, uh, this is I. This was still during my apprenticeship, so I didn't even have my my electrical license yet. So I was still apprenticing, and I was up in the rafters of the changing house at a public pool, and I was running wire up there. Now, because it was a public pool, and they didn't want people breaking in, and it was in like the inner city, the. Um, the, the construction was such that if you wanted to climb over the wall, it was open rafters. You could climb up over the wall, even if the door was locked, and get into the building. So what they did to combat that was they put chicken wire all up in the rafters. So while it was open air, the chicken wire prevented somebody from mm-hmm. climbing through. But what that meant for me is I had to climb up in through an access way, and even though it was open air, I couldn't drop down. I still needed to walk all the way down up in the rafters, and it was midsummer, which meant it was really hot up there. Even though I was like only mm-hmm. 10, t- 10 to 15 feet above the ground, like, and there, were, there was a gentleman working underneath of me, and I'm like, oh my god, it must be 15 degrees hotter up here. And he says mm-hmm. to me... <laughs> Well, you're closer to the sun. And he was dead serious. <laughs> I, I, I bit my tongue, but I wanted to be like, dude, we're 15 million miles from the sun. I think it has to do with heat rising and being caught up here in the rafters. <laughs> yes. I, I am much more inclined to believe that that's it, not just the fact that I'm 10 feet higher. <laughs> you're right. 
I am closer to the yes. sun than you, <laughs> but in the grand scheme mm-hmm. of things, not that not much. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so a very tiny percentage of distance now, closer. Now, we started off the intro mentioning holidays and talking about explosions. Mm-hmm. Do you want to mention that now or do you want to save that? Uh, we'll say that because what we want to do is get to these first because we're giving you some really easy ways. Okay, to I didn't want to get away from that if that was uh, meant to be talked about earlier. Yep. It is, it is not meant to be okay. talked about earlier. But um, Explosions, uh, explosions we, to come. We have explosions to come. And uh, the, the neat thing is um, uh, equinoxes are where the, um, the sun passes the equator, which also typically talks about that's spring and fall. The height of spring and fall happen at those times. So if you have a one sun system and your planet tilts on an axis, we gave you four easy holidays for every culture in your well, world. Now assuming they, fi- assume, assuming they, assuming suns. they figure that out, and and most basic cultures do. Most Stone Age cultures know when these things are because they know when plants start to grow, they know when plants stop to grow. So even before you have agriculture, you have an understanding of when the solstices happen and the equinox. That's one of the big reasons why a lot of people think that Stonehenge has something to do, holy wise, but it has to do something with. Uh, uh, positioning out where the sun is, it's kind of like a fancy sundial. Some people theorize uh, because depending on how you use it, you can see the sun through some stones at a distance at, a, at I believe, one of the equinoxes, which for that culture was like their big holiday. And you, you would be able to tell uh, when all everything happens based on this one set stone obelisk. This is from pre-agriculture societies. So um, these things go way back very early cultures adopt them. Those are typically going to be your baseline. However your seasons are defined are going to probably define holy days, good or bad, that uh, lead to your um, actual base holidays. But then you, you need some flavoring. So you, you need to come up with some interesting types of holidays. And, and, and you know, for those of you who think that this is just a, a Christian thing, I have a list of a few other holidays that come up at um, the winter solstice. And one is um, uh, soil, S-O-Y-A-L, like royal with an S. And that was a Native American one where they would use prayer sticks and crafted goods. And there was some gift giving, but it was a purification ritual to the best of my understanding. It was a hoppy ritual from North America. You know, there's another one called uh, Yadol, um, and it was. I'd from call that. I'd call Persians. that Yolda. Yolda. Okay, like Malda. Yeah. Okay, Yolda. Uh, and uh, there'll be links to these in the show, and I'll, I'll actually link to an article that that will go a little bit more detailed to these. But once again, it was the victory <clears throat> of light over darkness, and so that would come up in their winter solstice because guess what would start happening? Light would start winning again. The days would start getting longer. So in Zoroastrianist traditions. Um, light is good, dark is evil. So from that point until you reach the zenith, um, at the summer solstice, the light was winning, and the other half of the year, darkness was winning. And so that would mark sort of good and bad parts of the year. Can you give me the last one? Uh, let's just do one more of these. And, and there are a few well, more gonna, in here. I was going to take the third one, go, if I may. Hmm? So go take it, the third Itty Rhymey. So, would you agree with that, mm-hmm. Itty Rhymey? Okay, I'm just going to read it, but Jeff can probably explain more because I didn't get to read about this before. The solstice celebration comes Mm -hmm. in June rather than December. But for Peru, it is a winter solstice. solstice. And in this Incan Incan celebration is to honor... Mm -hmm. Uh, is in honor of the sun god. Originally celebrated by the by the Inca before the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors, the festivities included feasts and sacrifices of animals and possibly even children. The Spaniards banned the holiday, <laughs> but it was revived with mock sacrifices instead of real ones in the 20th century, and it is still celebrated today. And that actual uh, thing that he read there is is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. There will be a link to it in the show notes if you oh. uh, if you want to go. It's the article. Where, I hadn't where scrolled I down far stories. enough. I didn't realize you had three more. I thought you just had the three. Well, that that's yeah. way down in the links. Yep, yep. No, um, I'm. Uh, well, let's do them. But just to quickly hit over them, there's uh, Saturnalia, 
which is sort of the Roman precursor to Christmas. It's the festival that they think the Christians sort of adopted and, and modified as the basis for Christmas. It, it was like several days, it was the winter solstice, a lot of partying uh, and gift giving would happen over the, the, like it was basically, I think a week it typically would happen across. And they would do this interesting thing where they would invert roles. So uh, slaves were supposed to, in theory, be treated as equals during this time. As part <laughs> not, exa- of the not exactly inverted, in, in but... <laughs> Well, that's 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 funny. Uh, like, like like reading up on that one because, uh, you know, inverted. So like they'd be treated equals. But I think that's for yeah, really yeah. slaves. They were treated as equals as everyone else, and the inversions would happen within society itself. Um, and actually, can that you, idea can, actually can, can into you, my world. Can you as imagine a birthday. being a slave on that day and being like, oh, this is the one day a year, the one day that it ain't bad, the one day. It actually reminds me. Oh, and, and and the worst thing would be, you know, you'd like, you know, my luck, I would like, like have some jerk head guy who would own me who would be like, hey, I'm sorry, we just don't have time to celebrate this year. This reminds me oh. of, a, of a thing, a thing that I saw recently. <laughs> it is, uh, it is sort of, it is holiday related a little bit. It's a, it was about this guy mm-hmm. who's dressed up as a, a vampire. He looks very Nosferatu because he's got kind of like a melty face thing going on. And uh, it, sh- mm-hmm. it follows him throughout his Halloween day. And he has a great day. Like, children thinks, think his makeup job looks great. And, you know, he meets this nice girl and he dances and everybody treats him normal and everything. And at the very end, you realize that he's not wearing makeup. He's a burn victim. And the whole mm-hmm. video is to get you to be a little more understanding of the way people some people just look different but it's like it's kind of sad well it's very very sad yeah, I've yeah actually it's seen sad that because one. that yeah. guy for that guy halloween is the best day of the year because everybody mm-hmm. treats him normal because they think he's in makeup and it's all yeah. it also i think there was also a bit of um donating to your burn burn units aspect to that as well but it was a really neat hot take on halloween very, no, that, that's that's very cool you know because it's all about flavor you know, and experiences have a lot to do with flavoring holidays. Because, like, if you take something like Christmas, uh, there's another holiday right around Christmas. It might even be on Christmas Day. I'm not sure. But I believe it's the Feast of St. Lucia, which was a, 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 Scan- a martyr in Scandinavia. I'm assuming she was probably martyred when she tried to go up and spread the religion in pre-Christian days. And to celebrate that, you know, the women dress up in white. They put wreaths with candles on their head and red sashes, and they go walking around. But, you know, and s- some of those Scandinavian traditions – ultimately affected overall Christmas, the idea of the Yule log and wreaths sort of come from when those areas were incorporated into the religion. Uh, and and so then uh, it sort of affected everyone's Christmas, uh, you know, at least in places like the U.S. I don't, I don't think every place in Europe celebrates Christmas the same, but here we have a much more vanilla-flavored seasoned by a lot of European cultures Christmas. Um, but really what it was doing was it was probably taking some of the old Nordic... Um, solstice traditions and incorporating them into this new religion that was taken over. But the whole point of this one, though, was to help ward off spirits. Sort of like the idea that the spirits would come and then you'd have the All Saints Feast the day after Halloween. So it's sort of the same idea around Christmas in Scandinavia. And then you have the Harvest Festival in um, uh, China, uh, Dongzi, which is probably pronounced horribly I think you're probably right there. Dongzi. Uh, that depends on, on on the phonic style that it was used to do. Some aren't as good as others, um, uh, but I think, uh, I, I've actually been doing a, I've been doing a course on this. Trust me, it's very com- I think very all, complicated. It depends. I a think lot all on phonics how it's are created equal. <laughs> they are not because <laughs> what do you have? T A O and D A O. That was which joke. one's correct? T A O or D A O? Couldn't I couldn't tell you. I'm not a linguist. Well, I have not been taking this linguist question. course. You're you're in the midst of. I'd, yeah, no, it's actually one I'm watching on Great Courses I, right now. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> and it's not really a linguist course, but they go in and talk about why things are spelled differently, why you have Tao mm-hmm. and Tao, and in and, and, and places like the U.S. Why do you have Tao you and Tao? confused because you read one book. It's a change in the romanization of Chinese phonics. So uh, there was a system that was used for a long time that I believe is the one that's spelled T-A-O, and... Um, but it's pronounced D-A-O. So in the, uh, after the Communist Revolution, some guy redid it, some, uh, an actual Chinese man redid it and 
and try to shift things to spell them um, hmm. easier to read and to hurt Westerners' eyes a little less. So they take out a lot of the symbol, like the, like the apostrophes came out, the dashes came out, and it was spelled mm-hmm. more phonically. Which is why you also went from Mao Zedong to Mao Zedong, uh, because it was that's the that's the enunciation, close yeah. to the way you would. Because I knew that like like the the Dao De Ching that it was said the Dao De Ching, even though it's spelled Tao. Mm-hmm. And the Dao of Pooh. Yeah. And the Dao of Pooh. Um, and there's actually a really another interesting one I, I learned about in the most dangerous. I'll put a link to the most dangerous uh, holidays I found too, because of course this. <laughs> uh, there, there's uh, I I forget what they actually call it. I call it Peru uh, Christmas Fight Club. <laughs> what Christmas? And um, <laughs> Peru Christmas Fight Club, and it's this holiday that I'm sure the the police force in Peru love, love, love. I'm sure they do, but it, once again, it's probably going to a pre-Columbian. I believe Incan specifically uh, holiday uh, where men would show off their strength by by mock fighting, and so essentially it's fighting, but it's not meant to like conquer or take over. So it's like you, you know you get into the pit and fight each other. That would happen around the winter solstice and in, in this area of Peru, and still today in Peru, even though they're celebrating Christmas instead of the older uh, holiday that. Um, um, aspect of the fighting comes in, so like you'll have these pits with like massive brawls going on all over Peru, I guess. On what on, you're on saying Christmas is time. totally reminiscent of something else that I'm reminded of, but it's such a vague memory that I I don't even know that I can get into it. I want to say it's I, I'm thinking either somewhere near Italy or Australia where they do a similar such thing where it's where it's like it's but it's not it's not a mock like these guys go at it and there's like no rules mm-hmm. you just pummel the other guy and the only time it gets called is if someone passes out yeah <clears throat> oh okay yeah no but again oh, it's yeah, for no. some it's sort of little... celebration <laughs> yeah yeah and, and and like i said a lot of times you know especially when cultures would have fighting at a core at a point that those will usually be important at holidays or maybe a specific holiday you know, these are the you know other kinds of things to, to work in. Um, um, you know, and, and the thing is, it's all about finding seasoning. So you start off with your more religious, the obvious things like your 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 solstices and and and, um, and and equinoxes. But then it's like, what are major religious occurrences? Take those things out that are important to the religion, and, and create holidays at those times. And that's where a lot of holidays, even though we don't necessarily even religiously observe them today, or some people do, like like in the U.S. you have Easter, which some people uh, treat as a religious holiday. Other people, it's a completely secular holiday with connections to some other pagan ritual with a bunny. Um, that was a fertility ritual, but uh, it, but it's also where the Christians celebrate the returning of their Savior. Yeah, so, in the Christian um, in the Christian calendar, um, the, the the Easter holiday is actually the biggest holiday of the year, not Christmas, because mm-hmm. um, you're celebrating the resurrection. So it is kind of funny that many modern Americans look at it as candy and a rabbit, a lot of chocolate, and hiding mm-hmm. eggs. Like it makes mm-hmm. very little sense yes. when you uh, when. It's yeah. the hiding of the eggs, the chocolate. Yeah, so it's yeah. so consider that. Consider how some holidays, like consider, like I don't know where you live, whoever the listener is. You might be in the United States. I know we have listeners all over the world, though. Consider some of your holidays and how what it means and what it's about can be drastically different than how it's celebrated. And like, and this leads me to a very special holiday, quite possibly. My favorite holiday in the world. I've never celebrated this holiday, but someday I will. Uh, is another one I found. It happens on Easter Day on one island in, uh, the, uh, I believe, the Aegean. Uh, it's part of modern-day Greece. It's called Rocket Opolemus, and I apologize to anyone who has any vague understanding of how to pronounce Greek. That's, That's not right. bad. But it essentially stands for Rocket War Day. That's right. Easter on this island is Rocket War Day. And I don't know, there will be a link you, you to the video on the show have got to watch notes. the video. It is, it is insane. It is insane. The, it is insane. And like people have been killed, so be careful if you actually go to this, uh, uh, which I will at some point, but uh, I'll be careful. And so if you go be careful too, there are these two churches today 
And no one really knows even why they celebrate this holiday. They think it goes back to a, a, a naval battle, but a long, long time ago. But it's just part of the culture now, so they still do it. And the way they do it now is they have these two churches that are rival churches on the island. They set up like 30,000 rockets apiece and simulate a war by firing rockets literally at each now other's these, church. These rockets, and is it's a river? Is there, is there, is there, is there like, a river? They're like big, they're like there big a bottle rockets. Them? Uh, the video I saw, I couldn't tell because it was so. So, so you have you have these rockets, and think of the largest fireworks you've ever seen because these things are being fired qu- qu- quarter like mile, half rockets. a mile. Like, like it, oh, yeah. it is it is I, a I far say, distance yeah. from one church steeple to the other, mm-hmm. and these guys have like fifteen feet, and all, they they have these launchers. And they have like 15 feet of like a couple hundred rockets, and they just light them all off all together as quickly as you can. It looks like footage from like Desert Storm. You just see rapid fire, insane rockets f- launching over these mm-hmm. these town buildings. And I think there's a big distance in between that, that that was empty, which makes me think that there was a river there. And they're trying to hit the other church tower. Like that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that is the goal of Rocket War Day, and I don't know if they tally it up or somehow. And you see lots of these rockets just watching like the video, varying way off a of course. So that's like, can you people can get you hurt. imagine having a, imagine having a couple of houses between, between those two churches on that day? Well, and the thing is, I wouldn't go with it's empty in between because of a river, but more of there used to be homes there and they've all burned down. <laughs> So um, I I don't know, but it, it is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Like, on yeah, re- and I I do want to. It really is, guys. Like, point. definitely check out this video. And if if you don't if you don't go hunting for the link that Jeff's got, look it up. Just go to YouTube. I mean, it, it's 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 crazy what these people do. Because also, like my mm-hmm. my mom has a lake house, and we've gone to the 4th of July uh, celebration that they they do every year and it's not it's like a whole bunch of houses throughout the lake all spend a lot of money on fireworks we have gone and mm-hmm. the i have seen displays there that were better than i've seen at disney world and that's saying mm-hmm. something cuz disney yeah. puts on a hell of mm-hmm. a fireworks display good show and yeah. For the and I know that our my mom's neighbor lives right next door on the lake. They're one of the biggest houses that spends a lot of money on fireworks to do this. They by themselves spend about five grand a year on the fireworks. And what these mm-hmm. guys do in Greece, it's it's got to be more. It's just got to Whoa. be more. So there's also a monetary investment, unless they know how to make up make them themselves. But, you know, those chemicals are very dangerous to play with. But some of those those rockets don't look like they've come off a factory floor. They do look kind of homemade. But what do I know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yep. And then the one last thing to think about, too, as you're building up holidays, the older a country gets, the more it, it, it becomes a national identity, you know, away from sort of the old di- dynastic states of, of like ancient Europe and stuff. But, you know, when you really get England, when you really get uh, Germany and the United States as actual countries beyond the family who rules them, uh, even though they might use the name, it's really about the family, not about the actual state. And, um, but as you get, uh, uh, into more modern societies, you start seeing holidays too, much like religious observations that will pop up celebrating things that happen in the country. And those even go way further back to where like the Battle of Agincourt becomes an important thing. They get celebrated by British people because they beat up French people. In and Germany, you got Unification so these, Day when they finally you know, brought reunified, uh, reunified East, East and West, West. Germany. Which I, I I'm the guy who actually did that. So you're welcome, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you're so I'm such you're a so liar. kind, Jeff. Thank yeah. you. You're very generous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I joke because literally I got stationed in Germany during the first border patrol my unit was sent on. My first month there, they got called off of border patrol uh, because um, basically it started to happen. That's when um, basically the the Soviets uh, uh, opened up the border. So. Um, it, it was a very interesting time. So um, now, um, so to look a little bit, uh, I talk a little bit about the Iron Age version of uh, 
the Kingdom of Grabatus's um, uh, holidays. And they are a Bedrakum culture in my world, for those of you who know or don't know, but you, you do now if you're listening to this episode. They do have four major holidays, two on the equinoxes, two on the solstices. <coughs> um, they have, because, and, and this is bogus, but my calendar really takes care of all time. So the leap years happen once every 10 years. Um, and they know this somehow because it's it's fiction. <laughs> and, um, I love that. You know, cause um, reasons. <laughs> cause reasons. And, uh, but it, it, I came up with this holiday. It's one of the few that I really know about. It's called the Day of Second Chances. It is, it's like a makeup day. So it, that's the day, you know, you uh, go back to people who you've mm. wronged. And, um, and, and, and and see if you can start mm. anew. You know, you're not necessarily looking for forgiveness. You're looking to start anew. That's the point of Second Chances Day. And in the kingdom of, uh, or in the world of, if you're in the kingdom of Grabatus, you get one of those every 10 years. I, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to know when that day is in relation to the story we're currently doing in, in your world. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'll throw it, it in there. It might be fun. <clears throat> Um, be two weeks from now. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I know we totally just robbed you, but second chances day. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, he pulls this every ten years. <laughs> <sighs> um, okay, and then there are also twelve holidays, one feast day per month, uh, on top of the other ones. So the lots of holidays. And now the problem is, the poorer you are, the less likely you are to get maximum enjoyment. But typically, feast days. Um, um, the food comes from temples. Or they, uh, not so much in Grabatus. It usually comes from local lords uh, put on the day and and have activities for the, the peasants on that day. They're not going to get the full enjoyment like the lord will out of it, but uh, everyone is supposed to partake. And, and that is one of the keys because it's, it, you know, it's a way of your, of your lord sort of being nice to you, I guess, a couple of days, once a month. And, um, you know, um, and, and so there's 12 feasting days, and, and then uh, there's also there's a fertility um, uh, festival that goes across uh, planting season, which is as close to the equinox, but it doesn't necessarily coordinate. It kind of depends on the weather of the year too. But every year they're planting, there's actually the feast of Quania, which uh, this is kind of a crappy one. Uh, they have to actually provide feast for Quania the fertility goddess every year. It's actually Khan, Khan, Kana is actually the name, even though it's spelled with a Q. I'm, I'm speaking English when I read it. Um, um, and what happens is you have to actually make a sacrifice, something big for you. So like, and if you were a peasant in the middle of nowhere, you'd be like sacrificing chickens. You wouldn't normally want to do that, but if you could do one every day, that would, you know, increase your chance of having a good, a, a, a good year of crops growing. And then at the harvest time is the better festival because that's that's the festival where you're celebrating love and hospitality at home and you, you get a party, you get to eat a little bit more and make up for all of the hard work you've done over the past several months growing your food out. So there's a, a – and it's for every day that the harvest happens in a county, they have the Feast of Dark that happens. And um, big happy times with the biggest day at the end when it's all over. Um, and then uh, – the way the pantheons are broken down, there are three courts of gods. So think of, you know, like in Greek mythology, there's like um, Zeus's court and all of the gods are mixed into that court. Um, they actually have three different courts in Bedraca mythology. One is called the good and holy court. One is called the holy court. And then there's another one called the evil holy court. And, um, and the irony is... Each god in each of these courts are sort of all over. If you go back to like the D and D style alignment spe spectrum, so everyone in the evil court is not necessarily. Um, if you look at the god and what they do, you wouldn't say that they're evil. Um, but uh, according to the Petrachums, that they're part of the evil court, and overall the court is bad against them. So. Uh, they are a very pragmatic uh, uh, culture in naming stuff. So there's the, but uh, each of the gods, the, and there are 10 of them in, in the good court, uh, they each have a holiday. And then there's one of the gods, 
called the good world protector, meaning the world that we live on, the material plane, whatever you want to call it, um, where we exist, that got a, from the, the holy court also gets uh, a holiday once a year to celebrate essentially protecting uh, the, the, the literally the dirt be beneath your feet. So, um, but that's sort of the things I did. And then, you know, there's going to be after my first series of books, there's a major event going to happen, which will actually cause the first kind of national holiday. Um, but um, the culture really hasn't developed any of those yet. Uh, different areas, different locales have their own special holidays, but they're not really nothing big enough to be considered sort of nationally. So wherever you are, there are things that are important and they're not even known in other spots. So, um, and you even see that like the modern day United States, you know, everyone knows, um, um, Patriots Day, right? Hmm. Uh, well, not if you don't live in Massachusetts. I was about to it's, say it's a Massachusetts Sounds state familiar, holiday. But... Um, I think it's I think it's on the uh, the day of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. I'm not 100 percent positive. Uh, I know it typically falls around April 15th a lot, um, or April 15th can fall on it. Um, and then there, but in Boston itself, they have Bunker Hill Day, which is. Uh, uh, the day the battle was fought on Bunker Hill in um, Boston, and that's celebrated in Boston only. And it's right around the time of Patriot's Day, but that's Boston only versus the entire state of Massachusetts. Versus the entire um, country. <laughs> so, Versus the entire country. So, you know, when you're flavoring areas, especially if they're rich in history, they might have their own days. Whether or not they even still celebrate them, sometimes they, they go away over time too. But other places, if it's very seminal, like the Revolutionary War is very seminal to the state of Massachusetts. So uh, uh, they have strong connections back to those holidays, uh, even though uh, most places don't really celebrate um, uh, the Revolutionary War so much yeah. in the United States. We, we do the we do the day we declare independence, uh, yeah, independence, but not the day we won. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. Um, and then you take a look at some of the fun ones like. You know, uh, Groundhog's Day, which is a big deal in Punxsutawney, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, and was, of mm -hmm. course, you know, uh, immortalized in the movie Groundhog's Day. And it's really not that big a deal, but in the United States, we just kind of like, oh, Groundhog's Day. It probably wasn't as yeah. big. We, we observe it now, it but we don't really... I don't think anyone celebrates I don't celebrates think it was really. a big deal <laughs> until the movie. I honestly think the movie certainly made a larger um, uh, knowledge. People were more knowledgeable. I remember as a mm -hmm. kid, it would be like, oh, it's Groundhog's Day. And, you know, you'd find out if the groundhog saw his shadow or not. Uh, for those of you not in the United States, because I don't know if anyone else knows about this. Um, but Groundhog's Day is a day where it's, you know, springtime. I don't, do you know what day it is? I don't even know what day it is. I don't know, but it's, it's the, yeah, the, gra it's, the it's groundhog. groundhog the, the groundhog <laughs> comes out of the de comes out of his den, and if he sees his shadow and is scared by it, he runs back in. And what that means is that it's got, there's going to be six more weeks of winter because he has gone back into mm -hmm. hibernate for six more weeks. Whereas if he comes back mm -hmm. comes out and he isn't scared of his shadow, then it means we're in for early spring. So, it, mm -hmm. so again, you're getting back to a relation of seasonal change and harvesting and planting and what have you. But it's also the, like this ridiculous thing. Like I don't even know where it came from. And Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. has an official groundhog, Punxsutawney Phil, and they pull the groundhog out every year. And you know the mayor puts on this big goofy hat and he talk, you know, in air quotes, you know, talks slash listens to the groundhog and then announces whether or not there is another six more weeks of winter or not. And inevitably, I'm sure it's not true. I don't know. But it's but it's a fun Neither it's a fun I. little thing for them to do. And then they get they get recognized on local to national news every year for it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, like Connecticut has its own groundhog. So there are multiple groundhogs out there. But that's become sort of that one itself has exploded in importance, I believe. So or that specific uh, is the main one for the U.S., I guess. So. Uh, but I do like the K Connecticut, and I would imagine most other states have to have their own groundhog for some reason. Um, uh, just I, gu I guess we we, and, ha we have one. But I, I think that one was maybe more important um, before science started to show that there are better ways to figure out what the next <laughs> season is going to look like. You know, science. Uh, so uh, so maybe this used to be a really big thing, and it's 
it, it's it's something that is culturally still relevant, but not even enough for day no, off of work. Not even a not not so not not I don't even know a if bank you ever got holiday. a day off of work for it. Yeah, not even a bank holiday. So and and those guys, and those guys take a day off for everything. <laughs> As I say, if, if bankers and, and, and U.S. government officials aren't working, you're pretty, pretty certain everyone else is. So, um, so if they're working, everyone's working. So um, that's a neat one. So, but the thing is, don't overthink your holidays, but just think of what are core holidays, what are the most important things to a culture, and pick things. And, they, and you know, uh, go to the show notes. There's a link of Dangerous Festivals. They don't need to be rational or even make sense to the people who are still celebrating them. It just needs to, it just over hundreds and thousands of years, things really start yeah, to like stick. Like here, here's a, here's a, a fun a fun you little uh, anecdote. Like April, April Fool's, Fool's Day. Day, go for that one. You go, and then I got one. Okay, April April Fool's Day is after uh, the last major calendar update in Europe happened. It was the original day that uh, Europeans uh, in the Middle Ages celebrated. I believe it was New Year's Day. But then uh, they, the, uh, you know, learning more about the way actually to count the days properly, they got a lot better. They, I think it was actually King Henry who updated the count. No, it was George. It was the Georgian calendar I think we use now. Um, King George updated the calendar. And so it propagated very quickly to all of the aristocrats throughout Europe. So that, that's why it's sort of in the West, the predominant calendar today. But the old calendar, which I think went back to the Roman times, was still what pretty much most of the people, the country bumpkins would know because that's like what ten, they lived by. Ten months, I think. So, so if you celebrated, and this is all theorized because, once again, it's so far back we don't quite remember, but one of the good theories of April Fool's Day was you were a fool to celebrate New Year's on that day, so you're an April Fool. I did not know that. And, and, and it sort of sprung into today where you played jokes on people. Um, in uh, Munster, Germany, um, uh, Munster is... Uh, a special city for a number of reasons. One of the biggest being that that's where the peace was made uh, to end the Thirty Years' War. And if you go to mm -hmm. Peace, I believe it's called Peace Hall. It's the old city hall, which is literally the room they made peace in. Uh, there is a couple of artifacts, including a chalice shaped like a rooster that is like, um, I, I want to say it's like silver and gold. And it was ceremonially used. So getting back to like so, the groundhog or like other animals that get, you know, mm -hmm. uh, special because of some weird holiday or some weird thing. So there there was an area, and I don't know if it was in Munster or around Munster, where there was like a battle and uh, the, the sieging army decided to wait out the army that was inside the – we'll go with castle walls because I honestly don't remember exactly how it was. The basic mm -hmm. gist is – they were running out of food and the CG army is like, well, they're going to run out of food and then they're going to give up. Like we just have to wait. So they were running out of food. They had almost nothing left and they were ready to give up. But there was a rooster that nobody could catch. <laughs> they would have eaten this guy, but they couldn't catch him. And one morning he got up on the mm. castle wall and started crowing at the opposing army. At least, at least that's how mm. the story goes. He was probably just crowing for the sake of crowing. Yeah. But the point is that they were like, well, geez, if they still got a rooster, like that would have been one of the first things to go. It really just they couldn't catch this guy. But because of that mm. rooster, the sieging mm. army gave up because they figured, well, they must still have a lot of food in there. <laughs> and that that rooster became a symbol for them. So they made this. And here's what the interesting thing is. You know, pre like nation states, you're gonna have a lot of really cool things like that that happen that will never be forgotten in that city, will be memorialized. And when things convert from sort of dynastic nations to nation states where the nation becomes bigger than the rulers, um, what happens is a lot of times to keep the people, you know, to help unify the people around a central culture to be more identified with the nation. They're going to pick certain ones of these and maybe even elevate those to national holidays. And so you might even end up with national holidays based off of that very regional thing, uh, which was important at the time. Uh, and a very cool story. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would like that one. So, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, you want to start bringing this in for a landing? Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing I just want to say is think of, you know, those important foundational days. Think about some of the really burned in um, uh, sort of attributes of your culture and, and pick days that, you know, to make holidays around them. Don't get stuck in logic or convention too much because never forget Rocket yeah. War Day. I mean, there's tons of days like that all over the world. Like if you look up weird holidays, mm -hmm. you will find stuff literally all over this planet where it is town specific or city specific or just regionally specific. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that makes it so fun. Like the big, big holidays that are countrywide recognized, it's usually once, like you said, once the country has an identity. For the United States, I would say the biggest holiday is the 4th of July. But that's mm -hmm. because that's when we declared. Or Christmas. Well, I'm talking as a country, though, not not as a people. As a country. So, yeah. yeah. But once again, it's kind of like Easter and, and Christianity, you know, is the biggest holiday, but it's really Christmas. I mean, <laughs> it, it's not. Uh, it's just that that's where we get stuff and everybody uh, likes it. <laughs> not from a canon or right. dogma standpoint, which you're talking about, but at a reality standpoint, reality does not always match right. canon or dogma. So, um, you know, the thing is, don't get too trapped in the logic or convention. Make the holidays fun. Make them appropriate for your cultures. But th think about bringing out the, the cultural norms and showing them through the holidays. Because that's really the reason that why those norms stick is because they get reinforced over time. <clears throat> and the really important things, those are things that get celebrated. This is um, th somewhere in the real world they do this. Uh, but I think you did this in your world too, where on the birthdays, it's the person whose birthday gives gifts to all the people around them. Uh, my world, uh, and this is interesting because this is kind of taken from the Roman version of Christmas. It was what inspired mine. It's called King's Day. And uh, it's not that you give presents to everyone else. It's in the kingdom of Grabatus, kings are bad. Uh, no one, uh, kings led to the orc invasion, which took over the entire country. And they've since liberated the country, giving birth to a principality, really. But it's called the kingdom of Grabatus. And it's made up of a couple of different princes. There's no single ruler that rules over the land. Um, in this, thus, no king. corruption. And <laughs> well, yeah, none. Well, there's no, no corruption. corruption. Yeah, it's everybody on good. the princes. And none of you those can princes, trust those guys. They're not kings. None. Yeah, none of those princes yeah, would ever the ever kings try. Kings are the bad guys. A king, in in name or in nope. uh, actuality. <clears throat> um, nope, nope. Because that's just not the way the culture works. But it's really something that embedded well in the peasantry because that's what they used to sort of get the peasants to go okay we'll fight with you to get rid of these because for peasants they're orc lords or they're human lords it's not a huge difference. <laughs> same same um, boss it's <laughs> a new boss same as the old boss <laughs> ex exactly so for them but th th they end up buying into this whole ritual thing so on their birthdays there's a little song that gets sung and uh Peasants only. This is a social one. Uh, nobles aren't even allowed to celebrate uh, uh, King's Day, is what they call it. But you get to wear a crown, and you are king for the day. Huh. But uh, so that that's sort of how I got Huzzah. to my birthdays. So, uh, world so. building task of the day: create a winter solstice holiday for your world. Because odds are yeah. you have a winter somehow. And we're we're we're, we're not we getting into you multi-sunned people, <laughs> or we, we, we should call it a, a seasonably appropriate solstice-like uh, yeah. solstice yeah. day. Um, so uh, to make that, yeah, I think that's, that covers it. And then, re really important for your real-world task of the day is you need this this spring, uh, early spring. You have to celebrate your your day of uh, Vega. Uh, the goddess of basically plants. We'll just call her the god of plants, right? God, goddess of nature. Goddess, I should be more specific. Uh, because that's really important to your re real... Oh, no, forget that. That's not real. Go watch the video on the website about Rocket War Day and tell me that's not the coolest freaking thing. Just that, That's really your real world task. So if you want to do the ritual to... Uh, uh, via, go ahead, but really go watch the, the the Rocket War video. You can go to the website or go to YouTube and type Rocket War Day, and you, you, I'm sure it'll pop up. Rocket Wars! And once again, there'll be links in the episode. I hope you all have a great day.
Thank you so much for listening to the World Builders Anvil. We would love it if you would share the World Builders Anvil with two of your friends. And so would they. If they are unfamiliar with podcasts, then you get to introduce them to the wonderful world of podcasting. Take them to Stitcher or iTunes, or best of all, just send them to our website, www.gardul.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com. Now strike why the myth was hot.